On today's episode, we are joined by pro fishing young gun and absolute hammer, Drew Gill. We have Drew on today for a very unique interesting conversation about the analytical approach to bass fishing and what he's personally learned from watching all of these fish all over the country with this new technology and more importantly how we me and you listening to this show can apply that while we're out there fishing without this technology all that more on this episode of tackle talk hello everybody i'm bill dance and you're listening to tackle talk Welcome to the Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Tackle Talk podcast. We have a great show for you guys today, but first, we have to give a huge shout out to American Legacy Fishing. And by now, you guys know ALF is the first place that I check for new gear, and it should be yours too because they have a price match guarantee, they have the best sales, best customer service, fast shipping, and today I want to highlight their used gear. One of the coolest things about American Legacy is their giant selection of used fishing gear that they're constantly updating on the website. So you can buy gently used rods, gently used reels at a fraction of the cost of a new one. And right now, their used gear section is marked down even more than normal. So for instance, right now on the website, I'm looking at it as I'm talking here, they have a mint condition Dobbins Champion XP 804CB. That's a crankbait rod. Normally, that rod brand new is $270, but they have a mint condition one at ALF that's $207. So you save 63 bucks. Or if you're looking for a reel, right here on the page, they have an Abu Garcia Revo SX, normally $170 brand new, but this reel right now in great condition is $107.99. Those are just two of the 336 rods and over 62 reels that they currently have on the website, and it's constantly being updated. So check them out over at www.americanlegacyfishing.com, and as always, use code TACKLETALK10 to save 10% off any regularly priced items. Items. So used gear already marked down right now, so it's not going to work on the used gear because they're already on sale. But almost everything else on the website that isn't on sale, you can use code TACKLETALK10, TACKLETALK10 over at AmericanLegacyFishing.com. All right, everybody, we have a great episode for you guys today. Major League Fishing Bass Pro Tour rookie Drew Gill stops by. And I think a lot of you are really going to enjoy this conversation because once we actually get to talking about fish behavior and tournament strategy, you're going to see really quickly just how Drew is wired. And it's really cool to see. This is a guy that takes his craft very seriously. He tries to find every little way that he can be more efficient out there on the water. And then obviously it shows in the standings. So Drew finished third at the Major League Fishing Bass Pro Tour Stage 1 earlier this month against some of the best angles on the planet and then he followed that up with a win at Sam Rayburn for the Major League Fishing Tackle Warehouse Invitational stop there and since then Drew has been blowing up all over the place like I've seen him he's been on Bass Talk Live he's been on Bass University LBL Bass Edge the poor guy's been making the rounds all over the place but we're very appreciative that Drew took the time to come on the show and a little glimpse behind the curtain here we actually recorded this during the Major League Fishing Bass Pro Tour stage two stop that was a couple weeks ago so he literally got off of the water for one of the days of competition and hopped right on to talk so there's a ton of information in this episode that i think you guys are going to find really interesting from one of the true up-and-coming young anglers in the sport so with that let's jump right into our conversation with drew gill all right ladies and gentlemen we are joined today by major league fishing bass pro tour rookie drew gill drew thank you so much for stopping by i know it's been a busy couple weeks for you I really appreciate that, man. Uh, I, you know, doing, you know, just getting to talk fishing is always something I very much enjoy and, uh, being knee deep in the middle of the, of the spring, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, it's all all I'm, all I'm doing right now is just fishing and talking fishing, man. So it's, it's a pleasure to be on here. 
So the past couple weeks, you've had a win at the Tackle Warehouse Invitational. You had a third place finish, I believe, stage one of Major League Fishing at Toledo Bend. You just got off the water for folks that are listening to this now. This will come out in a couple weeks, but you just got off the water for day one of Santee Cooper with Major League Fishing stage two. Uh, and in between all that, I've seen you. You've been BTL, Bass U, making the rounds all over the place. They're running your ragged right now. But what have the past couple weeks been like for you? Man, the, the last couple of weeks have been, uh, it, it's been an extremely busy time for me, but you know, man, it's been a, it's been a tremendous blessing. What I would have done, you know, I, I packed my, uh, schedule about as tight as I could get it for the spring, just to where I could get as much experience as fast as possible. You know, when we talk about that, the learning curve that exists in bass fishing, this learning curve over time, over the last, especially three, four years keeps getting, you know, you have to narrow it faster and faster and faster to be able to just keep pace with these guys. And, uh, you know, so my goal was to, to, uh, compact my season into as many events as possible. So I, I signed up for all the invitationals this year and, uh, five Toyotas on top of the Bass Pro Tour schedule. And, uh, so I've just been tournament to tournament to tournament and man, I, I would have loved to have just gotten to sit down and like soak it all in last week after Rayburn and, uh, you know, get to interact with everybody that reached out and do all the talking about Rayburn that I could have done. And, uh, and really enjoy it. But I, I went straight to Gunnersville and uh fished Toyota there last week and uh you know didn't even get to practice. It was it was a fun week though. I mean Gunnersville's a tremendous fishery, had a had a good tournament and went straight from there to here and uh got here at two AM the other night and started practice. So man, it's it's been busy, busy, but the you know, the the amount of times that you hear in this sport where people talk about winning an event and how you know, your phone blows up and you, you do lots of, of press related stuff and lots of content, things like that. It's like, Oh yeah. You know, people are just trying to make it sound like it's like, it's a bigger deal than it is, or, you know, inflate that the importance of winning an event, but man, there is no stimulus to the content you can produce and, and the amount of uh, traction that you can gain, like winning an event and uh, yeah. getting the opportunity to do that, you know, a couple weeks ago is something that, you know, I, I had two seconds and I think I had five or six thirds over the last two years and uh, to come close that many times. And, you know, I, I had an inkling when I got up in line uh, on day three at Rayburn that, that that day might've been my day. And, and I, I wasn't ready to be disappointed again. I was so happy that I was able to pull it out. I think that like probably the most important stat, at least to me, when I look at bass anglers and I look at like you're measuring greatness, you know, over years, I think it's like top fives. I think top fives are really when you like uh, Aaron Martins is a really good example of this, right? Like if you look at just the wins column, it does not do justice to what Aaron Martins was an angler, because when you're in the top five, you're talking one fish, you're talking, you know, one small call away from, you know, a lifetime changing in that. And if you stack up like you were just talking about, right, three, four, five, six top fives like that's not a coincidence it's not a fluke that is like one little thing changing out there on the water between what you just got to experience the, you know these past couple weeks and people just kind of like glossing over it but it shouldn't be glossed over i really think top fives are like when you look at someone's resume is what you should look at yeah man i think there's there's a thing with the validity of having good tournaments and having good events is like you know, really our bread and butter in, in this sport in terms of recognition and, uh, and, and AOI points is top tens, like yeah. as many top tens as you can collect in a season time. But the thing about top tens is just getting top tens d builds a level of credibility, but it doesn't build a sense of validity for attention in the industry. Yep. And when you build up a lot of top fives, top tens, you gain the respect of a lot of the anglers, you gain the respect of a lot of the fans. But ultimately, you never garner any sort of spotlight. And, and those can help build a spotlight if you win an event. Like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of guys, you know, we look at major tours, we look at the Bass Pro Tour, the Invitationals, the Elites, heck, even the Opens. We're talking, um, we're talking 30 something events getting one every year. I mean, there's 30 something champions, you know, if, if it was to be a different person every tournament that win every year. So like, it's not in that sense, it's not a unique experience over the course of five years. You know, that's 170 something guys that get to win an event. But the thing is, is like, there's a difference between winning an event, just one off, you know, it either, you know, the storyline of it's their home lake and, and they do really well there. But outside of that, they, they struggle at times or like one of those situations where, where, people go out and they're not the most consistent. They're up and down, up and down, but eventually they, they win one. 
And, you know, there's a, there's a serious validity to being someone that's been in contention or been in the conversation many, many times and finally yeah. getting to win one. Because when you do finally get that win, it brings so much credibility to everything you did beforehand. So who was the coolest person to reach out to after it happened? Oh, man, that's a really good question. Um, I got to say, one of the one of the coolest comments that I got um, after after winning Rayburn was I, I uh, was looking through my Instagram comments the night after winning, and I looked and I saw Ott Defoe left a comment that said, uh, now that you've got your win, take it easy on us the rest of the year. And, and to grow <laughs> up watching guys like Ott, and, and I mean, he's been dominant. Like, you look at his AOI over the last five or ten years, it's nuts. He doesn't miss top ten in Angler of the Year any year. And uh, to to see somebody like that commenting something like that on on my post was it it really made my day. So that was that was the coolest thing I had happen after the win for sure. But I mean, really at a macro scale, the coolest part was just dude. I had in an hour after the completion of the weigh in and wrapping up some interviews and things like that for for the shows and things like that. Um, and all my all my sponsors. Um, I opened my phone. I had over four hundred fifty notifications. Good lord <laughs> and. Yeah, between messages, <laughs> calls, Instagram messages, Snapchat messages. I mean, it, it my phone just exploded. And uh, that, that meant the world to me, man. To just, you know, obviously the money's important and winning an event, you know, getting the hardware and the, the prestige of winning a, t- a major tur- tour tournament is something that I'm very, very grateful for. But Ultimately, for me, man, just the the knowing and the recognition that I've got so many people following along with me and, and following my my tournament journey is and getting to you know at least feel like they're sharing some part of that with me. It's just something that I, I I definitely treasure for sure. And it happening that quickly afterwards, it's not like you know information's trickling to these people at all you know depths of the internet or people that knew you you know twenty seven years ago. This is within a couple hours. Like these are people that are truly following and paying attention and immediately are saying like the first thing I need to do is tell Drew congrats. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it meant a lot to me for sure, man. So you're a younger guy. You're coming up. The trajectory of your career so far, it's been you know, Toyota series and, you know, tackle warehouse invitationals now major league fishing bass pro tour. You've really taken like, unfortunately now there is this fork in the road for anglers that are coming up and you have to kind of make a choice, which direction are you going to go? You've got now major league fishing, you got bass, you've got offshoots like NPFL and stuff. You've been MLF pretty much the entire time where that parent company the entire time where I don't think you've never, have you ever fished a bass open or anything? No, I never fished any Bassmaster Opens. I fished the Bassmaster College Series uh, right. as, as college events, but I never fished any Bassmaster events. So how did you choose, you know, the right one for me to stick with is this fork in the road versus this one on like the Major League Fishing side? Yeah, man. So there were a couple, you know, essentially driving factors for me as an individual and looking where, where I wanted to extend my career. And obviously, you know, I had the opportunity through a, a family friend that had given me the chance to fish some Toyotas to jump into that direction. But that was the direction that I was initially wanting to go. You know, first off, in my opinion, if you aren't beating Matt Becker, Jacob Wheeler, Dustin Connell, Spencer Shuffield, you're not beating Ott, you're not beating Michael Neal, you're not beating Alton Jones Jr. If you're not beating those guys for AOI, I don't think you can consider yourself the best in the world. You can, there are unbelievable anglers all over the place. There's tons of unbelievable anglers on the elites that are top, you know, some of the best anglers in the world. But point blank, if you're not beating a, a solid handful of those guys, I don't think you can call yourself the best. And as a competitor, I, I want to be the best, like objective, the best. And, the, you know, even that being said, it's kind of hard at this point with two separated tours to ever truly, you know, write the label of the best, you know, statistically we know who's been the best over the last few years. Like that's kind of, if you want to argue that point, you can, but it's really not statistically, it's not arguable. Um, My first driving factor and the second driving factor for me was looking at, so really it's not about looking at the Bass Pro Tour versus the elites because either direction you go, you're making a living, you're building a following and and a platform and a brand. And you're getting to fish against a very high level tournament field. So really it comes down to the, it for me was the qualifying circuit, which is, you know, the, the revolving door, in my opinion, that shifts the whole field around that fishes through the invitationals, the NPFL and the opens, which is in my mind is one group of anglers for the most part that, that kind of, you know, double dip in a lot of those. 
And the NPFL is, is, you know, gaining a lot of steam and they're, they're an organization that, you know, guys are making some money on and, and, but with the NPFL, that's right now, they're a fledgling circuit. Like that's, that's something that's just getting off the ground, whatever the opens, the opens are the qualifying circuit for the elites. But the thing about the opens is, although the opens are part of the same, you know, just step down from the top tour, their payout structure is more like the Toyota series. It's, it's, it's not something you can make a living doing. And for me looking at it, the, between the platform through MLF live and TV coverage, a better payout structure than the, than the other two and, and wanting to make the best pro tour. You know, I went with the, I wanted to go the, the pro circuit and now invitationals route because you, there are a lot of guys, you look at that field, probably 20% of the guys in that field do that as their primary source of income. And that can't truly be said about any of the other options. Um, and, you know, and the ability to get to chase that, that aspiration or that goal, but still be able to say, Hey, you know, if I, if I do a good job with my sponsors and marketing, I do a good job fishing. I I'll be able to make that and ride that as a primary source of income while I'm trying to achieve that goal. Cause like with the opens, man, you got to look yourself dead in the face at the beginning of the year and say, I have, you know, between the entry fees that they're paying and the expenses for five days of practice and the weeks of tournament, most of them are free practicing too. You gotta look yourself in the face and say, listen, I've got, Fifty-five to sixty thousand dollars that I can afford to throw away and not see a penny back on, mm-hmm. and it be okay. And for me, you know, man, I, there's a lot of individuals that either have established businesses or things like that, or or they come from you know a lot of opportunity. Like for me, I I didn't come from I won't use the word nothing, but I my parents weren't paying my entry fees. They were right. giving me the ability to to do this outside of you know they they did a very good job you know, raising me, you know, providing a roof over my head, you know, paying for, you know, whatever I needed to live my life in a, in an effective manner. But ultimately I was driving a 2005 vehicle with 200,000 miles on it. I was fishing out of an Oh one Ranger. I, you know, I was doing this to the best of my ability, but balling on a budget and yeah. in so, of sorts. And I knew that ultimately with the pro circuit invitations were out, like if I was to go out there and do well, I was going to make money. The opens, you know, one of my good buddies, Rob G, made it this year, and and Rob G barely broke even, finishing mm-hmm. in the top. You know, I think he finished fourth in the points. Yeah, out of two hundred something guys, and barely broke even. Like fourth in our points last year with the Invitationals was in excess of like one hundred and sixty thousand dollars of winning. Yeah, and I mean it's it's just a huge difference there for me, you know. And that's that's just my perspective on it because ultimately my biggest goals for me were, yes, I want to prove that I'm the best and I want to fish for a living. Yeah. In terms of just the, the numbers and the facts of fishing for a living, that was the direction that was the most advantageous for fishing for a living. And, you know, with the opens, I mean, you know, if that's the direction guys want to go, guys want to go fish classic. I, I totally understand that. I mean, who, who's grown up watching fishing and not wanted to fish the classic, yeah. but, um, but you have to look yourself in the face and, and, you can't look yourself in the face and honestly say that financially this makes a lot of sense, but you, if that's what you want, that's what you want. Like there's, that's the only way you got to go get it. But you know, for me, um, to prove that I'm the best and, and getting to fish for a living really was, was always my first and foremost goal and, and getting to kind of actualize that right now is something that I'm extremely grateful for. So, you know, I, that was a really, long-winded answer but i feel like it was kind of an appropriate yeah. answer to look at it from from all the angles from my perspective and just from the 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 situations that the sport is in right now and then you know i and that's not i'm going to say this caveat right now that is not whatsoever saying that the path that was right for me and what i wanted with my career is the right for is right for everybody because it's not yeah. other people's have other goals other aspirations you know there's the same thing with the guys trying to make the elite some fish classic same thing with NPFL guys wanting to fish the NPFL and, and start, you know, building that circuit. Like that's, you know, if that's your guys' goal, that's awesome. Um, but those were my goals and my aspirations and that's the direction I went. 
for me. So you said something there that I think is interesting. You said once you make the elites or, you know, the BPT with MLF, like you're fishing for a living. And I think for a lot of guys, that's true, but you can probably shed some light on this. There's probably some guys that that's still not true for, right? I think a lot of people think that it's just this glorious lifestyle. Like you get to this point, you're a pro angler and it's like, there's guys on the elite series that have full-time jobs and they are probably, they're probably going better than breaking even. But if you're not placing well that year, like, I mean, you're not making a lot of money, definitely not enough to support yourself and a family and all that kind of stuff. I don't know so much of the financials on the major league fishing side. I know they're obviously different, but you probably know, right? There are probably people that you're buddies with or that are on those tours that are still, for sure. you wouldn't be able to do it without a secondary job. And I think some people growing up just think he's a pro angler. This has to be awesome. He's rolling in money. It's like, not really. Yeah. I guess the, the angle I should have gone there is I, I kind of over oversimplified it by saying you're making a living. What it is is the opportunity to make a living if you do if you play your cards right with representing your sponsors well, marketing for yourself well personally, and and a combination of that and fishing well. I mean, if it it's the elites and the Bass Pro Tour are the easy opportunities to fish for a living on on yeah. a competitive fishing side of things. You know, that's not necessarily is everyone doing it for a living or as their primary source of income, but the opportunity, the real opportunity to do that is there on both of those platforms. Whereas, you know, when I say real opportunity, majority of the field with both is doing that as their primary source of income. Whereas none of those other circuits are the majority of the field doing it as their primary source of income. All right, folks, we'll get back to our conversation with Drew in just a second, but exciting news, new sponsor alert, sound the alarms. This is not a drill. The Tackle Talk podcast is brought to you in part by Mossy Oak. Yes, Mossy Oak, the name that is synonymous with the outdoors and the activities that we love. I've loved Mossy Oak for years. I actually think my first hat that I probably ever bought with my own money at Walmart was a camo Mossy Oak hat that I still have laying around here, but we're very excited to have them on board here at Tackle Talk. I know a lot of you guys, when you think of Mossy Oak, you think of hunting, but Mossy Oak fishing has some killer apparel for us anglers. In fact, probably if you go back and you look at our past few videos or little Instagram shorts or whatever, you're probably probably going to see me in a mossy oak hoodie a lot of times. That's a hoodie that I've had a really hard time taking off lately. It's so comfortable. They fit great. They're lightweight enough that they don't bog me down, but they're warm enough to get me through these late winter, early spring days on the waters. They're just awesome. And even better, right now they're 50% off over on the website. So you can actually go over to www.store.mossyoak.com and in the top right corner, just search fishing hoodie. H-O-O-D-I-E, and you'll see it pop up. They're normally $49. Right now, they're on sale for $24.99. So I just ordered a few more because when my favorite sweatshirt is half off, I'm going to jump on it. But you can head over right now to www.store.mossyoak.com. Click the fishing tab at the top. You'll see a full lineup of tech shirts, shorts, hoodies, their exclusive Bill Dance collection, all available right now at www.store.mossyoak.com. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Drew Gill. So you've dealt with sponsors over the past, you know, a handful of years. How much more important is it to them now to have a brand, have online presence, have this type of thing versus like, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you slap your name on a boat and you get some, you know, tournament coverage and that was how you sold baits. And now that just doesn't seem to move the dial as much anymore where I now like, yes, they're looking for credibility in the standings and they want you to not be sucking it up and you know finishing next to last and every yeah. but also like it seems like at least from the outside looking in it's almost equally as important now to have your own brand and have your own following than it is to be placing you know in cutting checks in tournaments yeah i mean that's that's been the big paradigm shift which has been you know driven by social media which is that it used to be that these these tournament platforms were using either their own pro- platform or someone else's platform and using you as a medium for demonstrating their uh, essentially competence in that in that space because they were saying hey we do this we understand that this individual is really good at what they do and they endorse what we do versus now it's different now they're buying your platform we You're all a have our own for them correct yeah. We all have our own individual advertising companies, essentially at this point, where we sell our own product, essentially, in in what we what we do on social media or what we do via live, whatever. Our our personality is our product, and you know how how our viewers and our followers engage with this is what 
these companies are interested in because it's not, yes, obviously a big part of it is like having, you know, these companies love having someone that has a ton of reach, somebody yeah. that has the ability to, to get their product to, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, and, and another important aspect of that is, is like the engagement of a following, you know, they, they want to see a following that's really in depth and, and in tune with what the person that they're engaging with is doing. You know, they want to see somebody that's extremely personable, willing to work with, both with the company that they're working with well and work with the fans and, and the people that are reaching out to them. You know, ultimately we are the the representatives of the sport, you know, on the competitive side and these companies to a lot of these individuals now that we're so easily connected, you know, that's the difference between professional fishing and other sports is like, you know, you talk about professional baseball, you can send out a hundred DMS to hundred MLB players and you might get like two responses. In in high level bass fishing, between comments or DMs, you can reach most of these guys a lot of the time. Like if you have yeah. product questions or or questions about certain you know different things with companies that they're working for, you they're easily accessible. And if yeah. if it's not there, it's at the it's at the Classic Expo, it's at Red Crest, it's at you know it's at different events throughout the year in person. Like we're the most accessible, what we'll call you know high level professional professionals in the world because we are you know it. It's not the massive industry environment that a lot of these other professional sports are. And, and so with that accessibility comes a responsibility to, to essentially be personal representatives for both the companies and for the sport. And I feel like somewhere along the way with the sport, we've kind of lost that at times where, you know, it, I guess some guys are really focused on their, their, social media presence but you know it kind of the never meet your hero scenario where sometimes you know the focus on creating such a good internet product you know the 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 in person interactions lack or vice versa you got some guys that are the best individuals to interact with in person that don't have a true social media or internet presence at all because that's just not where their focus is and and really most of these companies are interested in both for sure and that's that's the biggest change in how the sport works versus how it used to work yeah that's kind of what you are you're like a media outlet for the companies that you choose to work with mm-hmm. which is definitely interesting and it's a, a changing of the tide and you know i feel kind of bad for these people that have been in it for 30 35 years now where they're like this is not the same thing that i really signed up for back in the day basketball didn't change right you still go out there you perform you make a contract you get paid like that's fine your endorsements are on the side but that has nothing to do with you being able to go out there and make the Lakers and play basketball. If you can play, you yeah. play. But yeah, we're the one sport where it's like, no, we're not buying you as an angler as much anymore. We still are, but now it is more, what can you do for me? How much product can you push? How much reach do you have? We're using you as a billboard. 100%. Man. Yeah. It's the thing, the biggest difference um, with our sport and other sports is like the cost of living. Point blank. Like, no I mean, other sports, you sign, you sign a rookie contract with a, with a team for two years and you might sign it for $1.3 million or something like that. And like that lump sum of money right there, regardless of what happens after that point, that amount of money at one time is good enough for you to jumpstart your entire, your entire yeah. life, your family's life, whatever. It's a, it's a huge jump start for your, for your long-term goals versus our sport. Like, you know, you have a good year, you might make 150, 200 grand. That's awesome. You had a great year. You know, you made an upper level income. Now you got to look yourself in the mirror the next year and say, okay, great. I did that last year. Now I got to go do it again. And by the way, the one sport where it's like, no one's paying for your travel. No one's paying for your lodging. No one's paying for your food. Like if you're any other sports team in the world, like you're getting flown to places, they provide the transportation, they do your per diem, they do everything. It is just a totally different world. And I think sometimes we do get these like rose colored glasses where we see pro anglers. We're like, that's got to be awesome. It's like it, it definitely is, but it's also a struggle. These guys are sleeping at the Toyota Inn every night in the Walmart parking lot. And it's like, it's not as glorious as sometimes you think it is. No, man. I mean, I, I've definitely stayed in, I I've never stayed the Toyota Inn. Um, I have stayed in some pretty rough places though. You yeah. know, I, <laughs> if I was an individual, dude, I can't sleep in a vehicle. Like if I could sleep in a vehicle, I would do it sometimes just to save money. But I, I'll just stay there awake. Like any sound I hear, I'm like, somebody's breaking into my boat. 
Oh, like, no. It, yeah. And the thing is, you are no more likely or less likely to get your boat breaking, broken into at a Walmart parking lot as you are some of the hotels I stay at. Yeah, no kidding. But at least I'm like <laughs> separated from it where I'm like, it's either going to happen or it's not. Yeah. But either way, it's outside of my control. <laughs> so I'm just going to sleep and keep my fingers crossed. Yeah. And like, yeah, but it, it's, I mean... We're definitely not staying at uh staying at the Marriott every week and, and having people, you know, valet park our boats every yeah. night. That is that is definitely not the case. So one of the things I love about you too is you're a good old Midwestern kid, just like I am, just like so many of us, right? You grew up in Indiana, um, Mount Carmel, I believe. So talk to me about growing up in the Midwest because we don't see a lot of you make it to high level bass fishing. It's like everybody's from Alabama, everybody's from South Carolina and Texas and all these places, or they're from Uber up North where they're just a smallmouth mm-hmm. expert too. And we have that as well. We got, you yeah. know, Canadians and people like that, but this middle of the country folk, like where you've got Wheeler, Alex Redwine, like there's a, there's a handful of guys I can name that are within, you know, a couple hours of where we're from that have made it to your level. So talk to me a little bit about growing up in the Midwest. Where were you fishing cutting your teeth and probably not the best water too. And what does that do for you as you make your way up the ranks? Yeah, man. So I, I grew up fishing, uh, most of our lakes in Southeast Illinois that are, uh, you know, they're pretty small lakes, uh, dirt lakes, you know, they're, they're not clean fisheries. They're by no means visually appealing fisheries. They are dirt clay banks with lay downs. They're three or four miles long. And you're going to fish in a local tournament of 30 or 40 boats. You're going to fish, the same stuff probably multiple times throughout the day yep. behind half a dozen people. And mentally it prepares you. It, what it does for you is it, it prepares you for, for tournament fishing at a high level on a mental standpoint. It does not prepare you for tournament fishing at a high level on a technical standpoint. So like when we talk about the mental standpoint versus the technical standpoint, the technical standpoint of the two is by far the at this point, now that we have the access to information and the access to technology and the ability to understand these places, even before we get there through charts or whatever else. Now the technical part is probably the easiest part of the process. It's just, you know, being able to understand what you're looking at and, and learn all these different techniques and where they play. Yeah. The mental aspect is something that's kind of an intangible. So when you, there's, there's a few different mindscapes that you have in professional fishing between different anglers. So you look at the way that, that for example, we use the glaring example of Jacob Wheeler. Jacob Wheeler is a very high speed, high octane, throwing motor and move before he even makes a cast kind of guy. Yep. And he does it and he's really good at it. He's extremely efficient at it. Uh, versus you look at, you know, you look at some guys that have had a, stereotypical six you look at the way aaron used to fish aaron there were a lot of times you watch aaron fish around a a major boat ramp or you watch him fish a bridge of some sort you watch him fish around marinas you watch him fish a lot of places that are just population centers and he would be really meticulous about breaking it down and paying attention to the little details for he maximized what he found you know you got your guys over here that are about finding as much as possible and you got guys over here that are about taking what you find and making the very most of it. And I feel like a lot of times, you know, from, from my perspective, the best approach that you have when you grow up in a place like, like I have um, it to, to tournament bass fishing is, is looking at it from a, a very meticulous detail oriented standpoint of, you know, I've probably fished this spot three times today. There's probably been eight other people that have fished it as well. And over the course of time, you know, we just from watching fish interactions with baits on four pacing center, we can watch how, how pressured fish get time after time after time when you fish for these fish over and over again. And, you know, I, I became a spinning rod angler very, very early in my career because I was tired of sick and tired of getting beat by guys that were throwing the same techniques on the same places over and over and over again, just because they were more proficient at understanding that technique than I was. And if you're going to beat somebody on a, on their, you know, if, if the ball's in their court and you're trying to beat them, you're taking the advantage and giving it to them because you're saying, Hey, all this experience, all this information that you have built up over time on how to fish this technique in a certain way, we're putting, I'm, I'm going to allow you to have that. And I'm going to try and beat you at it doing the same thing. And that's, it's a really intimidating thing to do, especially at the age of, you know, 16, 17, whatever to go out there and beat all of the guys that have been fishing that lake for 20 years at what they do best. 
And so I went out there and I, I started mastering spinning rod techniques. I, I started figuring out how to throw a shaky head, how to throw a drop shot, how to throw a wacky worm, how to throw a Nico rig, how to throw, you know, finesse your type top waters, you know, like a, like smaller walking baits or a pop bar or prop bait, you know, learning how to, instead of all the situations where everybody throws a spinner bait or a, a shallow crank bait or something, learn how to throw a trap, learn how to throw a swim bait, learning how to, to take these conventional techniques that everyone was throwing, you know, in, in top water, everybody throws a buzz bait around home or everybody throws a plop or whatever. And like taking what we understand about these certain types of techniques and why they work and finding other techniques within those categories that are a different angle at the same fish. And through expanding my horizons a little bit, but still understanding that bass have rules, you know, obviously certain things work in certain scenarios, but expanding my horizons enough where I can be versatile enough to go and catch those bonus fish behind people as much as possible all day, it allowed me to be, you know, start getting pretty successful at home. And it got to the point where with, you know, on the tail end of me fishing a lot around the house, I would win, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to win about 85, 90% of the tournaments I fish just because of a lot of times it was just catching bonus fish yeah. one here, one there catching them on places that either were community holes or catching them on places. I, I never caught a fish up to that point. Never will again, just because I, you know, you'd have an opportunity and when you have that opportunity, you try and match that opportunity to the most non-pressured, but also effective technique at the same time. And that's really the best way to beat pressure on smaller fisheries is like, you know, finding that category of techniques and why they work in the situation they're in in picking something in that category that is, you know, either less u- utilized and, and more likely to convince a fish to, to bite or choosing something that's a little bit more efficient or effective at, at, you know, covering those spaces in a timely manner to where you can give yourself the opportunity to come back and actually have a second try a lot of these places with different techniques. And so like, it, it's just a change in mindset, really. It's not necessarily that you change in how you fish the fishery. You're fishing the same places. You're fishing them same time of year, fishing for the same fish a lot of time. But it's a change in mindset. It's a change in saying, okay, I'm locked into this, this scenario on a small fishery with a lot of pressured fish. It's a captive audience. That's the words I always drive into people's heads when we talk about fishing small fisheries or fishing around pressure is you're fishing for a captive audience. This group of fish, they can't get away from you, but they can't get away from anybody else. And so you're fishing, you got to assume that every fish you're fishing for has been fished for before, which means, you know, if you're fishing around the bank, you see a clump of grass 40 feet up from you, you don't go barreling at it on 10 right. on the trolling motor <laughs> with all your graphs on and just chuck your bait up there, hang it in the grass and like kind of snatch it out of there. And then, oh, I'm, I'm going to drag it real nice and slow now. Yeah. No. If you're going to, let's say you're fishing a clump of grass on the bank or something, and you're going to, you're going to pitch, you know, you're going to pitch a swim worm or a sinko at it. I'm going to line up 60 or 70 feet away. I'm going to lead it by 20, 25 feet. And I'm going to, I'm going to bring it in. So whatever technique you're throwing, I don't care what it is, swim bait, jerk bait, crank bait, you're throwing a spinner bait, you're throwing a top water, you're throwing a, a finesse technique like a drop shot or something. Posture changes are the biggest thing that make fish decide to eat or not eat a bait. So basically we're talking about very drastic posture changes. And I'm I'm not necessarily talking about how there's just one ultimate rule that all bass follow, which is not true. But whatever technique you're throwing, you you got to talk about what am I trying to emulate or imitate in a scenario. So like let's talk about like a swim bait, for example. You're throwing a ball head swim bait. How often have you ever seen a shad swim straight down, nose down, and then go and start swimming flat? Never. I've never seen that happen. <laughs> yeah. If you're throwing a ball head swim bait and you've got a specific target you're trying to throw it at, throw it 40 feet past it and get your bait on that flat tracking path where you want it before that fish ever recognizes that your bait is there. That is one of the biggest things. Same thing with a drop shot. What is a drop shot worm supposed to imitate? Anything? No, it doesn't imitate anything they see, but it's a severe posture change when you let that thing fall to the bottom like this and then you kick it and it's like this. Yeah. Severe posture change and nothing in nature does that where it goes from one very aggressive and continuous motion to another aggressive and continuous motion. Nothing does that in nature. And they know that. I mean, obviously if you go out to farm pond and you huck it out there and you catch one on it, great. You go around that farm pond three or four times, you're going to have to get really tricky with how you go to catch those fish because you've educated, yeah. you know, the fish don't start smart. They start dumb, but over time we educate them more and more and, when we talk about things like that, 
what we want to do is make our presentations as, as realistic as possible. And a big thing with that is posture changes. You know, you, you don't want same thing with the top water. Anybody that's throwing a walking bait. I don't know anybody that's throwing a walking bait outside of the herring legs, which is a unique example that wants to be walking a bait. And then it just like dive under and pop up and then go back to walking because that's, that's an aggressive posture change. You know, that you watch it on scope when you're, when you're watching a fish follow a top water bait, and you keep a rhythmic cadence or you kind of, you know, go stop, go stop. And then you, you pull it wrong and you like foul it on the trebles and it starts hopping sideways or does something dramatic like that. That never triggers them to eat it. Right. They, they always turn off it. And so people think the, the common knowledge of do something different with your technique or trigger them to bite. is just do something different. It's not just do something different. It's, it's do something it's really about starts and stops more than it is about doing something different. It's about the, the cadence and the speed of your retrieve because you don't want to have aggressive posture changes. Things in, in nature, I mean, we always have the wounded bait fish idea, but the, the amount of time that you truly see a bait fish that's just swimming around wounded, it's not that often. Rarely does that happen. And, uh, you know, ultimately, because of the fact that you know, you don't see that happen that what that would lead one to believe, you know, this is just my theory. If something in the water is wounded, it most of the time does not survive very long. And I think a lot of the time, you know, a lot of the fish you're fishing for are a little bit more skeptical when something's acting unnaturally because of the fact that they just never see it. It doesn't happen often. And, and what just watching fish interactions on forward facing sonar proves that out a lot of the time is like, they, they don't like, when your bait does something incredibly unnatural, even if you're doing it in the, in the guise of trying to trigger more bites. There's a lot to unpack there. Obviously the first one, yeah, the wounded bait fish thing is a great example. We do, you hear it. It's just one of those colloquial things that has made its way into our vocabulary. Where it's like, you want to be a wounded bait fish wounded, but you're right. How many times have you been on a lake? You've seen a shatter bait fish or something. It's like half dead on top of the water and doing this. And it's still there three hours later. Like, it's not immediately coming up sometimes and getting just absolutely smoked either. Like I think sometimes they are so conditioned where they're like, no, I'll go after the 74,000 normal looking ones over here, right? That are all together and aren't going to get fooled. I've been caught on four walking baits in the past three weeks. <laughs> like I'm not falling for that again. So yeah, I love the idea too of avoiding aggressive posture changes because I think we've seen that a lot of times, like I'm a river guy, creek guy growing up, and you want to talk about easily spooked fish, like growing up, it was like the name of the game was how can you get your bait to go past this fish, you know, accurately and naturally without spooking that fish. We're in, you know, clear water creeks that are maybe two foot, three foot deep. It's like those fish are so easily spooked and every fish that you catch, every good fish anyway, is as far as you can cast within the first couple pops of the pop or the first couple swims of the swim bait or whatever, because again, it's like, where can you undisturb that fish the most with getting the right cast in? So you're talking about like yeah. saying, okay, I see the clump of grass up here 40 feet away. I'm not going to just blow up to it. I'm going to get in position. I'm going to ease because you can never unspook fish, right? Once it's yeah. done, it's done. So you have one shot at this and I would rather take my time, make three or four casts that aren't exactly perfect, but I haven't ruined that spot yet either. So you still have a chance to work your way up to that cast that you're trying to do. All right, everybody, we'll get back to our conversation with Drew Gill in just a second. But first, we are brought to you in part by Arctic Coolers. No matter whether you're hunting, fishing, hiking, camping, whether you're going solo or with a crowd, you deserve a cooler that is as tough and as adventurous as you are. And that's where Arctic comes in. Arctic makes the best hard coolers, soft coolers, and drinkware designed to stand up to the harsh situations that we frequently put them through. And they do it at half the price of the other guys. So the only four letters you need on the front of your cooler are R-T-I-C. And right now, they've got their spring sale going on where you can go over to the website. You can save up to 40% off their signature tumblers and their travel mugs. You can literally get a 20-ounce Arctic tumbler for like $8.39 right now, so under 9 bucks. Meanwhile, the other guys charge 30 to 40 bucks each. They also have 15% off backpack coolers. They've got 40% off insulated water bottles, all kinds of stuff over at www.rticoutdoors.com. Click the spring sale on the homepage. Again, that's www.rticoutdoors.com. Keep the adventure going with Arctic. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Drew Gill. I also love that you said you broke it down where you're like, 
you know, in the the Midwest mentally, it prepares you for it, but technically it doesn't. And I think that's probably my attitude toward it too. I think we are so conditioned to you go fish a Tuesday night or we've done it a billion times where you go to take off at this lake and there's four spots that you can fish basically. And 25 boats rush to four spots. And if you don't be one of the first to get there, well, you're just going to wait in line and you're still going to fish that spot. You're not going somewhere else. So when we had on, I think it was Wheeler. When we had him on, I asked him something fairly similar and he said, That basically, like, he didn't think in the Midwest you could generate enough bites to get technically good at things. And I think that's sort of what you're kind of hinting at, too, right? We don't have the ability to go out and a lot of times at these lakes have these 200 or 100 fish days or whatever. You're fishing for so few bites because you are on these small, muddy, crappy lakes, right, that we're trying to catch these you know, three or four line burners to go, you know, take some money home where you don't have the chance to get really, really good at techniques because you don't have as many bite opportunities here that you do have other places. And I thought that was a really interesting way to look at it too. And that's, that's the value of fishing on fisheries where you catch a lot of like the biggest learning opportunities we have in bass fishing for learning techniques is always on fisheries with tons of three to five pounders where you get, a repeated opportunities at good ones day in, day out over and over and over again. It's why you see guys from, you know, obviously back when it was really good, especially, but North Alabama, Tennessee, you know, a lot of those fisheries have a, a good, healthy helping, uh, you know, Chickamauga used to be this way, especially Gunnersville for sure, where you get the opportunity to day in, day out fish for fish between that three and five range. But the thing is too, is like around the house, our fisheries aren't different enough. All of our fisheries around the house, for me at least, they all set up the same way. Mm -hmm. They're all almost the same depth. They never have any current (laughs) aspects. They never have any clean water. They, they, you know, some of them have some bank grass, some don't, but no offshore grass, no real offshore cover other than brush, just brush fishing. And like, it's, it's very cut and dry. It's like fishing the same lake over and over again, other than some of the lakes have a better population. Some of them don't, but regardless, you're fishing the same approach. It's just on different lakes, and like you don't have diversity whatsoever. And so, really, you gotta you gotta learn the mental aspects of like for me, you know, the, all those little technical aspects of learning how to fish behind people and, and trying to generate as many bites as possible from the opportunities I got. Something that's very much bled it over into my, you know, my fishing styles. I try my best to. Uh, keep track of all the percentages of the bites that I get versus fish that have interacted with my bait via using, you know, forward facing sonar and know exactly when those op- opportunities interactions happen yeah. um, to, to dial in as much as possible, the best line size, weight size, bait profile and color all for, you know, one certain technique. And eventually if you go through that process with enough different techniques, you're going to end up, taking a whole category of baits and shrinking it down to two or three options in every category. It's always two or three options because one bait does one thing particularly well. Another does another particularly well. And another one does another thing particularly well. And outside of those two or three options, you don't need anything else because those fulfill what you want out of those different techniques. And like, you know, for me, it's been a, it's been a situation where I always want my bite percentage. If I, if I can get it there, I want it at 75% or better. So okay. I want to catch three out of every four fish I throw in front of. If if I can so help it, I want to catch three out of every four. Generally, the more shore and, and offshore cover oriented you get, the lower your bite percentage goes. Um, so just a generality. Um, obviously this isn't the case when you're fishing shallow around a a big crowd or a lot of pressure, but like when I'm shallow fishing, generally speaking, my highest bite percentage all year is up around the bank. Like, because a lot of times we've duped ourselves into thinking we have tons and tons of opportunities. Every third cast, there's one looking at my bait and he's just not eating it around the bank. Most of the time, even in the spring, if you're having a, a, if you're in a good area and have a lot of opportunities, a lot of opportunities around the bank in the spring is going to look like nine to 15 opportunities in a day's time. It's not 45 opportunities. It's not 60 opportunities, not a hundred opportunities. It's nine to 15. And even with subpar presentations around the bank for fish that aren't super pressured, just general, you know, we're talking about general shallow fishing. You're going to catch on average, even without dialing in, you're going to catch about one in three. You're going to catch about 33%. 
Um, so let's say you catch one in three out of 15 fish. That's five. You're catching five of the 15 you throw. From. You know, that's depending on the size might not be a bad day, but if I'm going to throw in front of, if I know I'm not going to throw in front of more than 12 to 15 fish all day, those are, those are going to be my opportunities. Why on earth would I not take the time to dial it in as much as possible? And this is talking about more like a practice to a tournament scenario, yep. taking the time to watch those interactions happen and switch up my techniques a little bit throughout different categories of baits to extremely and ultimately finitely dial in my presentation as much as possible. Where like, you know, the last, the last three major tournaments I've fished um, have been Sam Rayburn, Gunnersville, and here, uh, you know, today was the first day, obviously don't have a big sample set for here yet, but uh, Sam Rayburn, the first day of the tournament, my bite percentage was somewhere around 70%. It was, it was decent, but it wasn't really, you know, I knew I could get it a little bit better because I wasn't fishing that deep and I wasn't fishing, fishing for pressured fish. They were singles. They weren't groups yeah. and they weren't on individual targets. They were just kind of roaming around in these shallow grass areas. Um, but I knew I could do a little bit better. The next day I made an adjustment in my bait and my color and to my bite percentage went to, I think 90, all 95% second day. I caught like 19 out of 20 fish I threw in front of. The last day, my bite percentage was 100%. And th- we're talking about, we're not just talking about dinks. We're talking about fish over two pounds. Fish over two pounds is always my focus. I don't count fish under two pounds into this equation unless I was in the rare scenario of being on like a Red River, Sabine River, Ohio River, something like that. Yeah. But um, but in this scenario, I'm always talking about fish two or better. I had 100% bite ratio the last day at Rayburn. Gunnersville. Went into Gunnersville. The first day of the tournament had 80% bite ratio. Second day of the tournament, I was at, I think, 70 and change. And the last day of the tournament, I was at 70 and change on, on bite ratio. Here this week, because <clears throat> uh, I haven't done the math on it yet, today I was probably on an 80 and change bite ratio. So I something like that. I had I had six opportunities at a fish today. And, well, I guess bite ratio, I was 100% today. I had six opportunities to catch a bass, got all six of them to bite, lost one. Uh, but like, if you take the time to dial that in, if I didn't take the time to dial that in, like today was not a great day for me. I, I'm in 23rd out of 40 after the first, that's, that's poor. Not happy with the way today went, but six opportunities at catching a bass in a day's time is a very small number of opportunities. Yeah. And if you don't take the time to dial in the presentation and the profile to the nth degree in that scenario, it could go from poor to catastrophic in a hurry. Like what we're trying to do is we're trying to take catastrophic to poor. We're taking poor to decent. We're taking decent to good, good to great, and great to exceptional. What we're doing is we're taking the the variables we can control and the details we can pay attention to, and we're trying to in, make ourselves about ten to fifteen percent better every day just by paying attention to the details, not by changing the way we fish. You know, in terms of the way we're fishing the fishery. And not by changing the fish we're fishing for. Just by changing how we're fishing for them, we're taking that one part of our game, which is how we fish for the fish we're fishing for, and we're taking the time to dial it in where we're 10 to 15 to 20% better every day just because we took the time to take that approach. Because let's say over a three-day tournament, let's say I'm an average of 15% better you know, in terms of bite percentage in a day's time, and I, I we're taking this in a vacuum and saying we're landing everything we hooked. If I'm 15% better in a day's time, over three days of a tournament, I am 15% better three days in a row. Let's say that I, I should have caught about 13, you know, let's say 14 pounds a day. Okay, let's say I'm catching 14 pounds a day and I'm 15% better than that um, over, the course of, over the course of the tournament. We're talking about, you know, we're probably in the vicinity of being you know that takes you from what 14 pounds a day to 16 and change a day for three days i mean you go from 14 pounds a day to 16 and change a day that's two and a half let's say two pounds a day just to make it clean two pounds a day better you're six pounds better by the end of that event six pounds over a three-day tournament generally that's like 10 to 12 spots and if you can just by paying attention to details not finding new fish not finding a different pattern but just paying attention to the details of how we fish that pattern, if we can make ourselves 10 spots better every event all year, you talk about a tour style deal. That's yeah. huge. We talk about seven events over, over the season. That's 70 points you're picking up 
just by paying attention to the details, not finding new fish, not changing how we're fishing, just changing the techniques we use to approach those fish. We are 70 spots, 70 points in AOI better by the end of the year, just, just because of that. Have you always been this analytic with your approach to it? Like there are going to be people that just listen to the last five minutes right there and their mind's going to be blown a little bit that someone is paying that much attention to bite ratio and, you know, the percentage difference from day to day and things like that. Is that something you picked up from someone or is that something that you've just always been or are a lot of anglers like that? We just don't see that side of it sometimes. I think a lot of ang- I say a lot. There's a lot of anglers that aren't like that at all. They're all about, you know, just ultimately as many opportunities in a day's time as they can get. And they're just trying to be extremely efficient. And that's the efficiency mindset. This is the maximization mindset. The efficiency mindset is always like, where's the next place I'm going to land on? The maximization mindset is this might be the last time I land on. So I want to catch everything that swims. I am, this is scalpel. This is chainsaw. Chainsaw is (laughs) hacking its way through. You know, regardless of of the result, but the chainsaw is going to do a lot of damage. It's it's going to hack and hack and hack. The scalpel is extremely precise. You are trying to be a vacuum. Everything you interact with, every opportunity you have, you put it into the box. And you know that's it's just two totally different mindsets. And I, I will say of the scalpel mindset, you know, like we'll call this, you know, for this demonstration. I mean, Aaron Aaron works is a great example, like. Aaron Martins was, in my opinion, one of the originators of what I'll call the vacuum group of individuals, which is they would go into an area and through dialing in their presentations and maximizing what they knew was there. Like you look at a classic example was the Chesapeake Bay tournament Aaron won. He had one primary area that he utilized for four days of the event and won the event in one area just because he took the time to break it apart make as many effective presentations as possible and use a few different techniques to try and maximize what was there and take the population he was on and turn it into something more. And, you know, of that group of individuals, I would say, yeah, a lot of them are extremely analytical, but they don't realize they don't do it in a number sense. They just kind of know it. You know, they're fishing around. They're like, this doesn't feel right. I'm having too many interactions that aren't going my way or the, you know, in a sense of non forward facing sonar, you know, they're, they're fishing in an area that sets up right for that time of year. In that scenario, in a place where they caught them a week earlier or something like that. And like, they're not getting the same results. And like, they know to in, intuitively, you know, to make an adjustment, but uh, I just try, you know, it, this is something I took on my, probably my sophomore year of college was I looked at it in an analytical sense for a long time, but like, I didn't put a numerical value to it. And like the ability to just take it and break it down by the numbers and look at how many opportunities I had, how many times I got the fish to bite, how many times I landed the fish that I hooked, you know, which is a part that I, that I bring in whenever I talk about travel and baits and things like that. But, um, when you, when you take that, you, you take the human bias out of it. Cause ultimately we, I, I would say a confidence bait a lot of times is something that's kind of detrimental to your development as an angler, but we all have things that we want to work. Like there's, I mean, there's so many days I go out there, like, let's say in like May and June, um, you know, post spawn on like a shallow fishery. I want a top water to work really bad because yeah. in May and June on a shallow post spawn scenario, rarely are there techniques better than, than top waters of some variety, whether it's frog, a buzzbait, a, a popper of some sort, rarely are there techniques better than a top water in that scenario. But sometimes there are. And through paying attention to the, just the raw numbers of it, rather than just saying, Oh, he, every time I throw it in front of one, he's looking at it, but just won't eat it. And like, just working myself up all day because I'm seeing all these fish looking at my bait and I'll bite it. I'm just looking at his raw numbers. I'm saying, I don't care. You know, I'm not even thinking about what the technique is. I'm just paying attention to purely how many interactions I had and how many bites I got. And if I don't meet a certain threshold, I'm making an adjustment, I'm making an adjustment, I'm making an adjustment. And eventually and maybe maybe the the initial adjustment that I moved away from was actually the best option, but was just you know there's situations where my bite percentage is not better than twenty or twenty five percent in certain scenarios, especially pressured fish. But when we take the time to say you know this is this might be good, but it's not good enough, and we work our way through that progression, eventually we will find the best option, regardless of whether the best option is sixty percent bite ratio, seventy percent, eighty percent, ninety percent, whatever. We take the time to work through that. We will, it'll eventually play out where we find the best opportunity. And, you know, like this is obviously this is coming from someone that 
that watches every cast I make all day. But like you look at, you know, that, that same May and June post-spawn scenario and you're on a lake, you know, you're pulling in the back of this pocket and there's, there's four different laydowns with duckweed around them and in this pocket. And you see fry on the corner of every one of these laydowns. I mean, you know, odds are you're, you're in front of four opportunities to catch a bass more than likely. And, you know, you, you know, when, even without forward facing sonar, a lot of times, especially around the bank, we know when we probably have a good opportunity. And even though we can't use numbers and as much in a raw sense in that scenario, we can still use those same concepts by taking a set number of opportunities at a prime target and breaking it down that way, rather than breaking it down in opportunities at an exact fish, but opportunities at a likely target based on bites we've previously gotten or things we expect should be happening because ultimately regardless of whether we're seeing what's going on or not we have to be able to make sense of what we're doing because if we don't make sense of it and we don't apply rules to what we're doing ultimately what we're doing is we're just trying to get lucky we're you know it's the whole scoping and hoping scenario we we don't even if we're not using scope we don't necessarily have to be hoping Unless we just choose to do it in a kind of willy nilly fish what's in front of me kind of way. Yeah. And you know, that that's just not a good way of learning and understanding the scenario you're in, because ultimately if you want to learn what's around you, you've got to look at it with a, with a process. And if we take the process out of it, learning could never happen. That's a good point. And it's kind of snuck its way in here a few times, but obviously one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on was you are very proficient with electronics. And I think obviously that's the way the world's going. That's the way all the tournament circuits are going. But the cool part about electronics, no matter how you feel about them, I'm not here to make that argument. We're just here to talk about when you have now this much time watching fish and seeing and kind of unlocking, you know, what was previously unseen under the water surface. And you spend hours and hours and hours watching these fish react to certain things and their tendencies and their movements and things that were a secret to us up until, you know, five, 10 years ago was really when we started being able to see some of this stuff. And like I said, there's a lot of us, you know, I grew up fishing, you know, creeks and rivers and things like that, where we may not be out there actually using live scope, but we've been able to observe so much and you've been able to observe so much over the past couple of years of what that can help us out there on the water in terms of, you know, uh, how these bass are moving and reacting to certain things. So my first question on that front was when you're watching these fish just on a pure movement pursuit level, like what have you learned watching largemouth and smallmouth to both of these, but how they pursue certain baits and how they react to certain things that might have surprised you? Yeah, so there's there's a few really key things when we talk about bass behavior and how we've always viewed them that might not entirely be correct. So the first one that we've got to understand is bass. This, this is where it all boils down to. Although bass, yes, they have a lateral line where they can sense things coming through the water. They can hear, they can smell. Ultimately, with bass and with any other daytime predator, because even though you can catch them at night, Bass are primarily daytime predators. From watching them on forward-facing sonar at night, they struggle to find your bait. Like they, they know kind of where it is, but you ha- may have to make multiple approaches for a bass to actually find your bait and eat it. Now they're really easy to catch at night because they can't see well, and when they do find your bait, that's their one opportunity to eat it. But ultimately, you know, they they are not a a nocturnal predator. They are a daytime predator. So, daytime predators, most of them. Their primary source of of information and data collection for you know their their predation habits is, is sight. They are sight feeders objectively. So we got to understand that bass are sight feeders. Large mouth, small mouth, spotted bass, all of them are primarily sight feeders. And when we look at sight feeders, we got to look at the way that sight feeders. You know, we got to look at the way that they interact with their environments. Most of your sight feeders and your sight predators are going to be more chase and kill predators. So when we look at a a chase and kill predator versus an ambush predator, a true ambush predator is one that is is diverting from their course or where they're choosing to live in a very minute amount. And what they're doing is they're setting up on a hole or a a corner, a a piece of cover, and they are literally just sitting there until whatever they're trying to eat gets in striking distance where in one movement they can grab it and go right back. You know, we're talking about things like uh like you know, you look at a lot of, of sharks and things like that that are, uh, you know, predators that will submerge themselves in the sand sometimes and, and wait for something to swim directly over their head. They'll pop up, eat it, go back down. 
Uh, same thing with like, uh, you look at a catfish in a hole or a catfish in a brush pile. A lot of times you'll pitch at it and you'll miss it a couple times. And be like, Oh, that's a bass. I just haven't hit him yet. And you'll bring it right over his nose. And as soon as you do that mouse and, and he eats it, even though you may have gotten it within four feet of him on either side. And he has just has not chosen to move whatsoever. And you bring it over his head and eats it like it was catfish aren't pure ambush predators, but they're much more of an ambush predator than a bass. Is. A bass is a chase and kill predator. It is not going to sit there in the brush pile perfectly stagnant until you bring your bait right over his head. And then he's going to open his mouth and just sit there. A bass is going to hear your bait coming. He's going to turn. He's going to come up. He's going to follow it. And bass will follow baits to your feet. If a bass is interacting with your bait, you have to do something really wrong or that he really doesn't like to make him not follow that bait anymore. I don't care what it is. They will follow it to your feet. Even if you don't see them, they're there following it most of the time if they interact with it. The only exception is that rule is if they're really relating to one target or like a a bed fish scenario. But like, let's talk about a fish on a lay down. You know, you may throw up there, you reel your spinner right over it. And he comes up, looks at it for about 15 feet, and then he goes straight back to it. Versus sometimes you, you throw a spinner right down a rip rat bank and you reel it. That fish is probably going to fall at your feet because he's not relating to a piece of cover. He's related purely to the area that he's in. And he is generally, you know, more prone to feeding. I mean, generally yeah. when we talk about fish, not fish don't use cover to feed. They don't. Cover is their opportunity to rest, recuperate, and keep a bearing on their surroundings and know where they're at at any given time. Yep. Cover is not used as a feeding opportunity. When bass want to feed, they get up and they float around. They don't just sit there and wait for something to swim by and then, oh, pop up, eat it, go right back down. They, when, like you watch school bait swim over a brush pile, they don't just sit there waiting for the school bait to just get just right and then they pop up and eat. No. School bait gets within 30 feet of the brush pile, and all four bass that are on the brush pile are coming off, chasing the bait for 200 feet. They're going to annihilate the bait, and here's another crazy thing. As soon as they're done eating it, they will turn beeline straight back to the pile. They don't ever even have to look for where it is. They know where it is. They have and a home base. Yeah, they just know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's their point of reference for their environment. So yeah. they're first and foremost, they're a site right. Second thing with bass specifically is that we've always viewed them as like, because of the fact that fish on the bottom were always the easiest to target, we always, you know, for a long time, people were fishing big crankbaits. They were throwing a Carolina rig. They were throwing a Texas rig, a jig. We were dragging things, catch them on the bottom. Because we were like, oh, bass feed on the bottom. Or most bass live on the bottom. That's not true at all. Those were just the easiest fish for us to target. Most bass, I say this, most not being uh, a portion of a population and another portion does a different thing. This is based on time of year. 90% of the year, bass prefer to feed up. 90% of the year. 10% of the year, like you watch this, and feed up does not mean they're always coming up and eating a top one or a glide bait or a jerk bait. Feeding up means that when they choose to feed, it's going to be on a plane that is beneath whatever target they're trying to eat. So like this, this goes for like throwing a Nico rig out there and you watch four fall out to the bottom. You can leave it there and shake it all day long. But if they're not feeding off the bottom, they're not going to eat it. They'll stare, but they won't eat it. And the next time you snap it and you hop it up, you hop it up, hops up, they eat it right then. That's their opportunity versus like, you know, same thing with like a a swim bait. It goes over their head. They will come up and smoke it. You drop that same swim bait down below them, they will not eat it. You cannot let a bait get below a bass that wants to feed up. If you want to feed up and you let the bait get below his face, he's done. It's over. 90% of the year, they feed up. The 10% of the year, and this is a rule of thumb. Your unique fishery at Lake XYZ might be totally different, so don't come knocking my door down for this. But <laughs> this is a general rule of thumb that works probably at least, I'd say at least 95% of the time, 19 out of 20 times, where the time of year where fish want to stereotypically feed up, and this is large mouth specific, but where they stereotypically want to feed up is 90% of the year, but the 10% that they don't is generally directly around the spawn. So it's pre-spawn, like late pre-spawn, right around the spawn, and just barely in the post-spawn. But generally, as soon as you get into the post-spawn, that's when they're back to feeding up again. You know, that's when you're they get in that fry guarding mode and they start eating topwaters, eating wacky yeah. worm, whatever. And then they get offshore and you catch them on a drop shot and piles, or you catch them on a big worm, hopping a big worm, or you catch them on a flutter spoon or air jig, something like that. Um, but really, we're talking about late pre-spawn in the spawn. 
And for whatever reason, like September and October, I don't know what it is about September and October, but like the late summer, early fall, when it's just dog tired, hard to catch a bass for whatever reason, most of the fish I weigh in those two months of the year on the bottom. Like I, I throw a bait out there. They will. And it, and it's, it's almost always another thing with that is it's almost always heavy baits. I always, hmm. you know, for a long time, I was like, it's really tough, small baits, light baits. And then I, sw- I made a switch at like the Ozarks this year was the first time I really played. This was in September at Ozarks and I was really struggling to catch them. I was like, you know what? I'm tired of throwing these fish super slow and it taking forever. If I'm not going to catch them, I might as well not catch them fast. And so I, I shoved an eighth ounce nail weight in my Nico rig, which for those of you that don't throw a Nico rig much, eighth ounce is a lot of weight for a Nico yeah. weight. <laughs> and I put an eighth ounce weight in it, bombed it out there. First fish I threw out, the very first one. And this fish was suspended. This fish was on a marina cable at Lake of the Ozarks, about 15 feet above the bottom. Throw my Nico arm out there, gets past his face. And instead of doing what, you know, I normally was doing, which was just kind of, I just kind of hang it there and shake it and see if they, and they kind of follow and follow and not eat. This time I I snapped it and he gets on it. And I was like, you know what? I flipped the bail open and it absolutely plummets to the bottom at a million miles an hour. And that fish just gained speed the whole way. And as soon as he got down through it, killed it, ended up catching 13 and change that day and almost 16 the next day and went from the late thirties to seventh place by the end of the event doing that. Went to Lake Cumberland a couple of weeks later for a, a regional tournament there, a USA Bass and regional tournament, and caught 17 pounds of smallmouth throwing a, a heavy Nico the same way. You know, and they wouldn't eat a light when they'd come up and look at it. But I think a lot of times with those fish that you're trying to catch on the bottom, with fish that you're trying to catch on the bottom, especially deep, a lot of times a heavier bait is better because of the fact that what happens with those deep fish when you try to drop a bait on them, they're very aware that your bait is there. And if you're throwing a lighter bait, they have a lot of time to come up and get on it. They also have a lot of distance to follow it back down to eat it. And so basically, if you've dialed in, these fish want to eat a bait off the bottom. What you want to do is you want to bring them as, as little off the bottom as possible to where they're already in that zone where they they really bass have a fixed attention span. Whether it's really long or really short, most bass in a certain pattern have a fixed attention span. And so if you're working with a fixed attention span up, where they're feeding up, you want to have a very light bait where you can really hang it in place and not move it a whole lot and take advantage of the fact that that as soon as they see it, they're flying up and they're going to eat it. You don't have to have them follow it down, follow it up, follow it down, follow it up. Versus if they're eating down and they have a fixed attention span, I don't want to have to have them start that attention span high and keep attention all the way to that opportunity that they want to eat. I want it. I want them to take that fixed attention span and match it with the best presentation for that opportunity. And for whatever reason, September and October, uh, they like to eat off the bottom really well. And a heavy bait matches it very well because at that time of year, they've been very pressured all summer. And that attention span is really, in my opinion, is at its shortest all year in that time of year. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my rundown there. I wonder what changes around September, October, where they just flip this switch and they want to pin something off the bottom. Like, I mean, obviously it's not a fluke if you were able to replicate it a couple times. Yep, I did it at Lake of the Ozarks, did it at Cumberland, did it at Kentucky Lake. Um, just about everywhere I went all fall. I, I've done it at Smith Man. Lake in October. Um, and I don't know what it is. And it's not every fishery. You know, some places where they where they get up and suspend a lot, that's not that's not the case at all. Fish that are truly suspended rarely want to eat off the bottom. We're just talking about general largemouth yeah. or small reservoir smallmouth fisheries. Like, you know, the, for whatever reason, it's the case. I don't know why it's the case, but it is. Awesome. And um, so there's there's that. Another universal thing that people have to understand about water temperature and seasons as it relates to catching bass on certain presentations. Like, bass operate in two segments of the water column. Here and here. And they chase they chase things down in a different way depending on time of year. In the winter time, they're they're here. You know they're they're in this column. So basically, let's say this is a twenty foot column of they want to live in this twenty feet right here. They might come up and eat a jerk bait. They might come up and eat an a rig. They might go down and eat a jig. A lot of people caught winter fish on a jig. And so they're like, how do we differentiate the fact that we're catching them on a jerk bait and an a rig, and we can catch them on a jig too? And sometimes like a med rig, like. They're eating up, they're eating down. What does it matter? 
in the wintertime, it's about staying in that column that they want to live in because they don't have a very, they don't have a high willingness to follow your bait for a long distance in the wintertime. Right. They don't want to expend a lot of energy. And so <clears throat> when we're talking about that, we got to take advantage of that one column that those fish want to live in and they don't want to leave. And we've got to make that opportunity count in that, that section right there. Whereas, you know, in the wintertime, it doesn't matter how long your cast is. It does not matter how long you want to work them up. Chances are your opportunity to catch that fish will be in a, in a limited space versus the rest of the year. When that water temperature is higher, it's in this space. They want it in a part of the water column. They want it up. They want it in the middle part of the water column. They want it on the bottom. They want it in a part of the water column, but they will keep their focus and willingness to follow that bait as far as you will let them follow. But they are going to want it in a certain layer of that water column. And and that's that's a big thing we didn't recognize for a long time because we just weren't able to watch these interactions is that the, the wintertime is so different from every other time of the year because their willingness to eat a bait is directly dependent on where that bait is in relation to where they're trying to set up essentially <clears throat> versus the rest of the year. It's, it's totally related to where they want that bait to be in the water column. But if you get it even relatively close to them and it's in the right part of the water column with the right presentation, they will stay focused on it until they kill it versus the winter yeah. time. You can throw the right presentation, in the right part of the water column. But if you miss them or if you miss where they want to live, you're shortening the time. Let's, let's view this as like a circle. If you cut the circle, you know, this is a terrible circle, but if you cut the <laughs> circle, like right here, you've got this distance right here to take advantage of, of catching that fish. Versus if I hit the circle dead center mass, that is the longest opportunity I have to get that fish to commit in that zone of willingness that that fish has to eat your bait. Versus if I'm just trimming the edges or if I'm missing that circle entirely, that fish may beeline out to it and then cut right back in because that's that's as far out as he's willing to go from where he's wanting to live. And, uh, you know, it's, that's... I mean, really, I'm just kind of working together a bunch of like random universals, in my opinion. But like universals are are such a thing that we didn't have for so long in bass fishing because we didn't have the ability to understand it as a universal truth. You know, and when I say universal, obviously some fish are different, but like we, we don't have time to fish for the 2%. We're fishing for the 98%. And so like as far as universals for the 98% of the population, these are all universal facts that you gain from just watching fish behavior as a whole over and over and over and over and over again. So, uh, you know, those past that, man, I mean, there's, there's definitely some things, but those are the big ones in my mind that, that can benefit anyone of any skill level to just catch more bass consistently. There are those few little chunks of just universal truth right there. It's cool to think about, I guess you could call them like vertical zones versus horizontal zones for these fish, right? I don't think I've ever really thought of it on that plane before. And you're right, when you're watching forward-facing sonar, you can watch both of those planes. Like you can watch vertical, you can watch horizontal, and you can kind of tell how far across, whether it's, you know, 20 feet, 80 feet, whatever, that that fish is willing to move before it hits that zone. It's like, yo, that's like as far as I'm going. This is kind of my home base right now. I'm not moving you know, two football fields away, this is kind of where I'm hanging out, where there are certain times a year where you can get that fish to chase 70, 80, 100 feet across and watch it on the screen. So that is cool. All right, everybody, we'll get back to our conversation with Drew in just a second. But first, we are brought to you in part by Dakota Lithium Batteries. And one look at my Dakota Lithium Batteries, and you will see very quickly why they are my number one choice for batteries. My batteries are not new. They're not shiny. My batteries don't sit inside a really nice boat compartment for their whole life. These batteries are constantly being moved from my garage to my truck to my kayak where they're exposed to the elements all day, back to the truck, back to the garage, sometimes multiple times a day. And they're dirty, they're scratched, they're well-loved, but they take the abuse in stride. I don't buy batteries to sit there and look pretty. I buy them to perform in the toughest conditions that I can put them through. And Dakota Lithiums do just that. So right now you can go over to the website and pick up your own Dakota Lithium batteries and you don't even have to pay full price. That's because here at Tackle Talk, we're all about saving you money and you get an exclusive coupon code that saves you 10% off your entire purchase every single time. And that code is Tackle Talk. 
10. So use code TACKLETALK10, TACKLETALK10, for 10% off your next battery over at www.dakotalithium.com, the official lithium battery of Bassmaster. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Drew Gill. All right, man, the next question I have here is actually from a listener. They submitted this. This is the mailbag question powered by Dakota Lithium. This question is from Colton, and he actually asked me, which I don't think I'm probably the right person to answer this, so in turn, I'm going to ask you, Drew. He says, have people noticed any major ways that the differences between species of smallmouth, largemouth, and spotted bass react to different baits with all of this new technology? What do you think about that? Have you noticed any major differences over the past couple years? I mean, 100%. Really, the biggest differences are not entirely between largemouth, smallmouth, and spots as much as the differences are between... I mean, yes, we we know some universal things that largemouth generally are are the shallowest slanted of the three. They want to be... They are also the most generally cover-related. When I say cover-related, vertical cover-related. Largemouth relate to vertical or suspended cover more often like smallmouth don't relate to suspended cover that much we talk about like brush we talk about marina cables and we talk about uh floating docks things like that largemouth much more often relate in a suspended fashion spotted bass are probably the most suspended all of all of them and probably the least cover oriented um and, and not saying that spotted bass are just always swimming around at 100 miles an hour but spotted bass relate to cover the least of the three Smallmouth are extremely like bottom composition um, and cover on the bottom oriented more than the other ones are. In general, you know, smallmouth will get up and suspend, but generally when they suspend, they're not suspending on, on a piece of cover. You know, that's why the Champlain sailboat scenario where everybody catches them on the sailboats and the ropes and stuff up there is so unique because smallmouth yeah. really don't relate to that stuff that often. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, that's difference. But really our main differences are between understanding whether we're, we're dealing with a Florida largemouth or a Northern strain largemouth mm-hmm. or a largemouth in Texas around timber or something like that. Like the way that these fish, you know, cause a, a largemouth in a lake that's got really clean water and bait acts very different from a largemouth that's in the Tennessee river, which acts very different from a largemouth that's in Okeechobee yeah. or Santee Cooper. Or, uh, you know, you look at like, uh, James River, something like that. Like those are kind of, even though they're all different fisheries, they're the same category of shallow, heavy cover, area oriented fisheries where you have populations that live in one central scenario. But like the real important thing is just to differentiate the difference between what t- group of, you know, the, the subspecies you're dealing with versus like smallmouth. Smallmouth, you have reservoir smallmouth, current smallmouth, and northern smallmouth. Even though you have current some places up north, smallmouth in the St. Lawrence River current do not act like smallmouth in Wilson Dam tail race current. Yeah. Or in like Susquehanna River, you know, fishing behind the rocks current. Or yeah. or in current that's on the on <clears throat> the main drag of, of you know, like Kentucky Lake out in the middle of the lake on a bar or something like that. Like yeah. current is not current. But like when we talk about current fish, current smallmouth. We talk about like Mississippi River, Susquehanna River, the TVA, like those smallmouth are really related to breaks, big objects. You know, they mm-hmm. they relate like current fish. But the thing about current smallmouth is you find them aggregated in groups a lot of times. Like you find them in in you know, one good area, and this this little ten yard strip for whatever reason consistently holds a dozen, fifteen smallmouth in one little strip. And, you know, in that sense, I think they act a lot more like trout and current than largemouth. Like largemouth, when you have heavy current, you will catch big largemouth and heavy current. But generally, like largemouth are much more solitary around yeah. cover, around cover. Suspended, largemouth are much more grouping than smallmouth. But around cover, largemouth are much more solitary. When you find smallmouth around cover, generally you find groups. When you find largemouth around cover, generally you find singles or doubles, maybe three. But much more often around cover, you find groups of 8, 10, 12 smallmouth on a big piece of concrete or a, a vein of rock or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then you deal with northern smallmouth on the Great Lakes, and, and we're talking about you know smallmouth that are, that are totally related to changes in water temperature and wind and fish that are related to what type of forage is in your northern fishery because some of them are goby fisheries which are going to lead you to cover 
And some of them are perch fisheries, which are going to lead you to traditional grass edges, suspended fish. And it, same thing with the alawai fisheries. They're an even more extreme example where you're, you're, it's purely leading you to drains and deep basins and places like that. Um, versus you, you throw perch and pickwick. It's not going to make a smallmouth and pickwick act any different than he already does because yeah. he's a current smallmouth. He's not a, and then we talk about reservoir smallmouth. We're talking about Table Rock, Bull Shoals, Cherokee, Cumberland. Talk about the smallmouth that are related to, like, you know, when we look at a map, understanding what part of the creek we're in, different transitions and different types of rock, um, you know, depth zones, like layers in the water column that we're focusing on, you know, are we fishing for them 8 to 12 feet deep? Are we fishing for them 18 to 25? Are we fishing for them 30 feet deep? Like, th- those fisheries are so much about those factors. And then it look like spotted bass. Spotted bass, you're talking about, you got current spots. Basically, you got your Coosa River spots, essentially. Yep. You got your reservoir spots that are like your Georgia, South Carolina, like your high, your herring fishery spot. Yeah. Which not all of them have herring in it, but it's the same category. And then the last is like, you got your Kentucky spot fisheries, your, you know, your Table Rocks, your Gunnersvilles, your your places with Kentuckys, uh, which I, I know Gunnersville has a few Alabamas in it, but the majority of spots in there, despite how big they get, a lot of them are actually Kentucky. Um, and you you talk about those differences. I mean, really, that's, you know, and I, I'd love to harp on it more, but really, I mean, Spotted Bass, you know, you deal with current spots are going to set up a lot more like spots are more similar in current to largemouth than they are smallmouth. They don't they'll group in areas, but they won't group in individual groups on targets. Um, and they're going to relate to baits that are up more than they are to baits that are down small mouth and current, you know, people wash two people wash Carolina rig, Ned rig, whatever, yep. generally large mouth and spotted bass and current people lean to a swim bait more or a jerk bait or a top water of some sort. And obviously small mouth will eat those things too. But a lot of times people lean for those bottom presentations more often for small mouth. Um, and then you deal with spotted bass and herring lakes, you're dealing with spotted bass suspended on cane piles or suspended on points or flats or big things like that. You know, you're dealing with large groups of fish, very smart, very aggressive fish, fish that are pelagic in nature. I say pelagic, not because they're just constantly moving around, but because they are willing to move around a lot. Yeah. And, uh, and then you deal with the ones in the reservoirs, like, like table rock or like Cumberland or Lake of the Ozarks, Gunnersville, whatever where those spotted bass are more similar to they, they act more similar to the large mouth in those fisheries, except for the fact that in those fisheries, a lot of the spotted bass will literally just randomly swim around like no pattern, no significance to what they're doing, no consistency to how deep, shallow, whatever they'll just, they'll just up and swim around. And, uh, you know, it really, obviously there's, we, we kind of know a lot of the, the very basic differences between large mouth, small mouth and spots, but generally we, a lot of times I think we try to apply general rules to each species as its own species. When in actuality, there's different varieties of each species based on what forage is in the lake, what the water clarity available is and how deep you're, you're dealing with on the fishery. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into play, but really for most things and most varieties of bass, you're dealing with three or four different individual types of the species. Yeah. And once you identify what that is, you can kind of think through that frame of thought. But man, like I could sit here and just harp on it all day long. Ultimately, you know, I I I feel like we've covered a little bit from each of them in in a in a very rudimentary and in foundational sense. But like, dude, that that kind of stuff is so specific to yeah, just getting in the scenario and experiencing it. That like, as much as I want to beat the dead horse of of how different they are ultimately until you get out there and you start breaking it down for yourself it it can't be it can't be truly quantified i mean it's a good point right we always want to put these fish in like three really nice neat boxes of large mouth small mouth spots and it's like you're right there are three four five six seven different varieties of each of them and then you put in all of the variables about the body of water that they're in and it becomes you know at minimum 
20, 25, 30 different variations of these fish, and it's just impossible to sit here and generalize them all. So it's one of those things that drives us crazy because we do wish we could just simplify this down and that there were just absolute truths that we could sit here and grasp, but there's really not. Like, it's such a nuanced thing, and I know that's, like, not what anybody ever wants to hear where, like, they ask a question and then the answer in fishing is always like, well, it depends, but it honest to God does depend. The thing is, like, ultimately the easiest way to understand bass is to understand their environment. It's not to try and understand the individual bass subspecies itself. It's to understand where you are in the world in terms of what the water temperatures range throughout the year, what forage is available in the fishery, what your water clarity is, what the contours look like in the fishery, and does what are the water level fluctuations throughout the year. And by taking these different, and, and another X factor that a lot of people don't take in, that consideration sometimes is the trash fish population what the trash fish population does throughout mm-hmm. the year where they relate you know it are the carp always spawning at the same time the bass are spawning which is one that people overlook a lot that totally changes the fishery because yeah. it when the carp are spawning in the same places at the same time as bass are spawning those fisheries generally have very poor populations of fish even if they have every single other variable necessary like if the carp spawn at the same time the bass spawn it blows it up yeah um but like if you try to understand their environment more than just trying to understand the fish themselves, the the environment will tell you what kind of fish you're dealing with more than just your kind of lockdown basic. This is the kind of fish I'm dealing with. If you just understand, okay, I'm on a lake in Oklahoma that's got rock. It's a flood control lake. It's it's got <clears throat> it's got large mouth and spots in it, and I don't have an abundance of of like the spinning cover. Mostly, what I got is big rocks bushes lay downs things like that like and i've got pretty poor water clarity throughout the year um you know you look at those variables and it'll tell you what kind of fish you're dealing with regardless of whether you're in gibson or you fall or you're in you're at uh you know any of the other dirty you know what's the one at hudson like some of those other little dirty oklahoma lakes like or same thing with the lakes in arkansas like norfolk sets up a lot like that um uh you look at a lot of those lakes and, and generally regionally your fish are going to act very similar regionally, but like yep. if you've got a lot of the same factors or um, different pieces in the environment that, that tour, you know, tend toward pushing fish in their life cycle to do certain things, even if you're on different fisheries, they're going to act very similar. If you have the same base level environmental factors. That's awesome, man. That is a ton of information. You're going to make a lot of people really happy with this episode because it is. It's like these type of episodes where you're going to have to go through and listen like three, four, five times to soak up everything that we just talked about in the past hour, hour and a half. So, Drew, I can't thank you enough for stopping by. Before you head out, can you tell folks where they can keep up with you this year, whether it be social channels or, you know, video content or whatever you're doing if they want to keep up with the 2024 season of Drew Gill? Yeah, man. Um, so basically, you know, you can find me on just about every platform at Drew Gill Fishing. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on YouTube. I'm just about most places you can find me. Uh, you'll find me under Drew Gill Fishing. Uh, that'll that's kind of my my standard throughout. Uh, but I, I really like to push people toward uh, the YouTube direction. That's something that, although it's not, it doesn't look, you know, it's kind of the caveat I give. It's not super developed at the moment. It's something that I'm looking to develop because. Uh, you know, my, my style of, uh, interacting with, with fans and followers and, and lovers of the sport is, you know, don't get me wrong. I'll do the 10, 15, 20 second videos, but my style is, is a little bit educational. It takes longer to extrapolate. And, yeah. uh, if you know, that's, that's the format that ultimately I'm looking to work towards. And uh, that's somewhere that, you know, if you're looking to, to get into hearing more deep dives into, into bass theology, that's a that's a direction that you're definitely going to want to check out at some point. Well, we've been saying it for a couple months now on the show, and I think it still rings true that the name Drew Gill is a name that you're going to want to watch the next couple of years because it's extremely evident that the trajectory of your career is heading in the right direction. And, you know, just the vast knowledge that we even got in the past 60, 90 minutes, it's very evident. The analytical approach, very serious to this, studying all of the little nuances. It is very Aaron-esque, right, of just all the little differences that you can do to get a tiny leg up on these fish when you're out there on the water and it's evident that you take that to heart so we appreciate you stopping by thank you so much and we wish you the best of luck on the tour this year man thanks dude i really appreciate it and i appreciate having you on 
All right, everybody, that is our episode today with Drew. Thanks for stopping by, man. I know he's a busy guy these days, but I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. There's a ton of substance there, and I myself have literally gone back and listened to this like two or three times since we recorded it just to try and soak it all in. But that is our episode today. Thank you guys so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, Amazon, wherever you listen. Shoot us an email tackletalkpodcast at gmail.com find us on the web tackletalkpodcast.com and we'll see you right back here next Tuesday for another brand new episode of Tackle Talk Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk Podcast Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes Copyright 2021 Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.